In this lecture, we're going to look at solving for the minimum mean squared error weights. This is going to be somewhat mathematical and involve a little bit of linear algebra, but we're going to go step by step and you'll gain some understanding as to how one solves these problems. And recall that the minimum mean squared error filtering problem assumes that we're looking for an FIR filter with coefficients WK that minimizes the error between a signal D of N and the output of the filter. So our objective is to minimize the mean squared error by choosing W and we're going to look at a range of times from little L1 to L1 plus capital L minus 1. Now this problem is most easily solved and formulated in terms of matrices and vectors. So we're going to collect all the coefficients of the FIR filter from W sub 0 through W sub n minus 1 into a vector W and the underscore denotes that this is a vector and then the superscript T denotes that we're taking the transpose. So in general I will assume that all vectors are column vectors and oftentimes when I want to save space I'll write them as a row and use a transpose. So similarly we'll collect the samples of the input signal x of n into a vector x of n, x of n minus 1 through x of lowercase n minus capital N plus 1 and again the transpose indicates that x underscore of n is a column vector. If I define these vectors then I can write the error in terms of the inner product between the x transpose of n vector and the w vector and of course then I'm subtracting that inner product from d of n. So I'm going to write e of n as the difference between d of n and the inner product of the input times the filter coefficients. Now next we're going to collect all of our errors for the time range that we're interested in into a vector underscore e. So here I've defined that vector. It's an L by 1 vector because we have capital L time samples we're interested in and then we can put the corresponding terms of d and the FIR filter output into vectors on the right hand side. And I'm going to collect each of the inner products involving the input times the FIR filter weights W into a matrix capital X transpose times W. And since we have capital L time values here that we're interested in, the matrix underscore capital X transpose is capital L by N dimensions. The reason we're defining things in such a fashion is that I can write my minimum squared error filtering problem of finding W as the problem of minimizing the inner product of E with itself. And we'll expand out this inner product by substituting for E using our definition above here. What I've shown in this first line is how to apply the properties of matrix transpose because we've got E transpose times E and I can bring the transpose inside the parentheses by taking the transpose of D and then when I take the transpose of a product of a matrix and a vector it's just the product of the transposes in the reverse order and 1 over L E transpose E is we'll just foil this thing we'll do D transpose D so that gives us this first term and then we'll have the two cross products. I'll have W transpose XD and D transpose X transpose W. Well since those are both scalars they're equal to one another and I can combine those and have negative 2 times 1 over L D transpose capital X transpose W. And then finally the last term is W transpose X x transpose w, putting the 1 over l inside, we'll write it in this form, and that allows me to define new terms, sigma d squared, which is the average squared value in d, and then I'm going to define p based on the inner product between d transpose and the columns of x transpose, 
and then we'll have R to be this product 1 over L X X transpose. So now we've simplified the notations. So to rewrite that, my problem of minimizing the mean squared error is now minimize over W sigma D squared minus 2 P transpose W plus W transpose R W. And what I've done different in the way I'm defining P and R relative to the previous page is that I'm expanding out the inner products in terms of sums over N. So before we go about solving for W, I want to think about this problem slightly differently. We know that the vector E is the vector D minus X transpose W. So what I'm trying to do when I minimize E transpose E is have X transpose W be approximately equal to D. So I can think about this as a system of linear equations. I have L equations with N unknowns. So what we know about solving system of linear equations is pretty extensive. There's basically three possibilities, and I'm going to view this from a signal processing perspective rather than a mathematician's or a linear algebraic perspective. because I'm going to assume that noise is present. As a result, all the columns in X transpose are, in general, linearly independent. So if L is less than N, then we have fewer equations and we have unknowns. We can have many solutions that will give us E equals zero. Now if L is equal to N, then there's a unique solution for W that achieves E equals zero. And finally, if L is greater than N, then there is no solution in general. And so we're going to try to solve this problem in a least squares sense that is to minimize the mean squared error. In the set of signal processing lectures that we're going to do in the immediate future, we're interested in L greater than N. One of the things we've shown here is that the filter design problem of finding an FIR filter that minimizes mean squared error is equivalent to solving a system of linear equations. Now I'm going to introduce a method of completing the square for finding W. And this involves rewriting the squared error in a special form that allows us to identify the solution by inspection. That means we need to do a little bit of linear algebra to get the mean squared error in a form that works, but it avoids the complications of trying to introduce derivatives. So let's look at the scalar case first to remember how completing the square works. You probably did this in high school algebra. So here we have something that's a quadratic function of w. And what we want to do is write this as a perfect square involving w. If we factor out the r, I can write this as w minus r inverse p parentheses squared plus sigma d squared minus p squared r inverse. The cross term of W times R inverse P times R is exactly what gives us 2PW. And then when I multiply R inverse P times itself, I get an extra term that wasn't present over here. And that term is P squared R inverse. And we're going to subtract that off so that I have the same expression here as I did on the left hand side. Now if r is greater than zero, then I can make this quantity on the right as small as it's possibly able to be made by choosing w if I set w equal to r inverse p. That forces this term to zero, and consequently the minimum value becomes sigma d squared minus p squared r inverse. Now this is a lot of work when you could have just have differentiated this expression to find the w and gotten to the same point, but it's not quite as much work as differentiating when we have the vector problem. So what we're going to do is try to rewrite our expression for the mean squared error in a standard form where it's a perfect square involving w. And in the vector case, this is a perfect square because if I set w equal to w0, then this whole term goes to 0. And then we'll have a constant term, sigma 0 squared, that doesn't depend on w. That will make the two sides of this equation equal. 
So for these two things to match up, the left and the right, we must have P transpose W be equal to the cross term, which is W0 transpose R times W. If we're going to satisfy that condition, that implies that P transpose is equal to W0 transpose times R, or we obtain that W0 would have to be the matrix R inverse times P. We'll talk in the next slide about the conditions under which R inverse exists. So if I multiply this out, having substituted for W0, I see that my perfect square becomes W transpose RW. Well, that's one of the terms I originally had, minus 2P transpose W, which is the other term that I originally had, plus P transpose R inverse P. And this is an extra term. So what we need to do to make the left-hand side up here equal to the right-hand side is set sigma 0 squared equal to sigma d squared minus this extra term we introduced when we wrote this as a perfect square. Now one more thing that we need to recognize before we can claim that w0 actually minimizes this perfect square is to show that for any vector a that a transpose ra is greater than or equal to zero for any particular a. And we can do that simply by solving for the matrix R using the definition on the previous page and recognizing that the inner product of a transpose x is identical to the inner product x transpose a and therefore a transpose ra is a sum of squared quantities and therefore it's greater than or equal to zero for any choice of A. In the scalar case we were concerned with R being greater than zero. In the vector case we're concerned with A and suppose R A being greater than or equal to zero. So finally we conclude that our FIR filter that minimizes the mean squared error takes the form W is equal to R inverse P. So this is a matrix times a vector, which means this is a vector, and all the coefficients of this vector give us the FIR filter coefficients. Furthermore, we see that the smallest value of the mean squared error we can obtain is given by sigma d squared minus p transpose r inverse p. Now before we conclude, we're going to make a couple connections to the least squares problem the vector D being approximated as a matrix X transpose times W. Now if you were presented with this problem in a linear algebra class, the classic approach to solving this is to multiply both sides of this equation by the matrix X and form the so-called normal equations, which are XD equals X X transpose times W. Now this on the left hand side xd is just L times the vector P whereas x x transpose is just L times the matrix R. Assuming x x transpose was invertible you would invert that and get finally that W is equal to x x transpose inverse times xd and this is totally equivalent to W equals R inverse P. And finally I have a couple notes that I want to mention. The existence of the inverse of R or the inverse of XX transpose requires that the number of equations L be greater than or equal to the number of unknowns N. Now this also assumes that the columns, there's also a rank condition on the matrix X that you'll see when you study linear algebra, but typically in signal processing we have noise and that is going to ensure that the inverse exists if L is greater than or equal to N. And the second note is that if N is very large or the data has a wide dynamic range, then you may be a lot better off by avoiding this computation of R inverse. The computation of R inverse requires a computational load on the order of N cubed. And that's why we may not want to do this if N is large. If there's a wide dynamic range in the data, then computing R inverse using this normal equation approach is subject to numerical error and there are better approaches 
that we'll talk about at a future point in time.